Uh, we will start the recording now. And again, my name is Benji Cohn with the Minnesota DNR. I work in outreach and fish and wildlife. And this is the 92nd episode of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series webinars. So today we got a really exciting topic. I um, swung by Cabela's and looked at some new ice fishing rods yesterday. So I am kind of getting excited to jump into the new year and, and try some of Tony and Joel's tips and tactics out here in some sturgeon fishing. So we get, uh, Tony is joining us. He is the uh, Minnesota River, River Fisheries Specialist and is a ice angler for sturgeon. And we're gonna start off today with Joel who works in the Minnesota River Area Fisheries Specialist who does a lot of research with sturgeon and stuff for the DNR. So welcome both of you to the program. And uh, Joel, if you wanna unmute yourself and share your PowerPoint, we can get started. All right, thank you. Okay. Looks good. So, uh, so my name is Joel Styrus. Uh, I'm the Metro River Fisheries Specialist working out of St. Paul. Uh, my main work areas are uh, Pool 2 of the Mississippi River and the Lower St. Croix River. I've been working on these rivers for over 15 years and have extensive, extensive experience with lake sturgeon. Uh, before we get to the good part about ice fishing for these prehistoric fish with Tony Sint, I'm gonna to touch on some of the management and history of, of lake sturgeon, specifically in the lower St. Croix River, since that's what I know best. Some basics about lake sturgeon on a broader scale before I get into the stuff that I really know. We have numerous lake sturgeon fishing opportunities across Minnesota most of which are catch and release fisheries. We do have harvest opportunities in two regions, the Minnesota-Canada border waters, including the Rainy River, Rainy Lake, Lake of the Woods, and the Namakan system. The other harvest area is the Lower St. Croix River, which is the stretch east of the Twin Cities, below the Taylor's Falls Dam, down to Prescott, Wisconsin. In order to harvest a lake sturgeon, uh, you must, whoops. In order to harvest a lake sturgeon, uh, you must first purchase a harvest tag prior to harvesting the fish. Uh, the limit is, is one lake sturgeon per year. A harvest tag is not required for catch and release fishing, uh, but you will still need to adhere to the open seasons. Targeting sturgeon during the closed seasons is not allowed even if you plan to release them. Uh, make sure you know the regulations for where you're fishing. Um, there is not a lake sturgeon harvest season on inland waters, and the catch and release seasons vary between inland waters and the various border waters. Some lake sturgeon biology basics. They are an ancient species with fossil records going back as far as 150 million years. Uh, putting them in the Jurassic time period. Their skeletons composed of cartilage rather than bones, and they have a notochord which predates a bony spine. They were almost wiped out in Minnesota in the early 1900s due to overharvest. They are adapted to living life on the bottom of lakes and rivers, vacuuming up insects, crayfish, mussels, and occasionally fish off the bottom with their protractile tube-like mouth. They are capable of living over 100 years, exceeding six feet long and weights over 100 pounds. Lake sturgeon are generally not mature until they reach around 45 to 50 inches long. Uh, they take a while to mature with males not reaching sexual maturity until around 15 years old and females around 25 years old. They make runs upstream in the spring to their spawning grounds, which are coarse rock substrates with flowing water, often below dams. And individual lake sturgeon don't spawn every year, uh, with males spawning every one to three years and females spawning every five to seven years. Lake sturgeon regulations have changed dramatically over the last 100 years. Uh, this graph is specifically for the Lower St. Croix. There are some variations in these regulations from year to year. Uh, but I picked out some specific years when significant changes occurred. The light blue bars uh, show the fishing season length. 
dark blue bars show the daily harvest limit, and the red line shows the minimum length limit for harvest. So to start out in 1915, there was a 10 month season with a daily limit of 25 sturgeon and no length limits. In 1920, the limit was dropped to one sturgeon per day. Uh, there was no length limit, but they did have a rule stating that harvested sturgeon must weigh at least 15 pounds dressed. Uh, so that's just a, basically a gutted fish, uh, which I'm guessing that would be roughly a 45 inch sturgeon. Um, you know, I'm not really sure because I've never actually gutted a sturgeon and then weighed it. So, but that seems pretty close. Like that might be about right. Uh, there was a lake sturgeon closure, closure from 1941 to 1946, then reopened with a one month season in 1947 that included the first minimum length limit of 30 inches. And there you see the season length fluctuate over time while the minimum length limit begins to get larger all while, while maintaining the one lake sturgeon per day limit. In 1968, the minimum length limit goes to 40 inches. Uh, in 1978, it goes to 45 inches. Uh, the major change in recent history was in 1992. Uh, we dropped the daily limit for an annual limit, uh, only allowing one lake sturgeon per year, and we increased the minimum length limit to 50 inches. Uh, the season was also reduced to six weeks. In 2006, we implemented the harvest tag, uh, requiring any lake sturgeon that is harvested to be tagged and reported to the DNR. In 2009, we increased the minimum length limit to 60 inches and changed the season to a four week harvest season followed by two weeks of catch and release only. In 2015, uh, we expanded the catch and release season across the state, allowing uh, targeted angling for lake sturgeon in inland waters and expanded fishing opportunities on the border waters. Uh, this was the first time since the 50s that it was legal to target lake sturgeon, lake sturgeon during winter months. Uh, ice fishing for lake sturgeon has exploded since then. This graph shows the history of lake sturgeon harvest tags sold since 2006 uh, in the dark blue bars. And the number of fish that were registered as harvested in the dotted green line. Uh, harvest tags sold was an increasing trend for the first decade, uh, trending down the last six years. Anecdotally, the decreasing trend is not due to a decrease in angler participation or sturgeon populations. It's likely due to a changing ethic amongst anglers to release lake sturgeon. Uh, average harvest rates uh, based on sturgeon harvested and tag sold was about 10% for the first eight years. The average for the last nine years was 7%. The majority of these lake sturgeon are harvested from the Rainy River and Lake of the Woods, uh, which has two separate seasons. They have a spring season and a summer fall harvest season, allowing one lake sturgeon from 45 to 50 inches or one over 75 inches to be harvested. And the most harvested in any one year was 367 uh, lake sturgeon were harvested in 2013. Uh, the map on the right shows the Twin Cities uh, with the Mississippi River and the St. Croix River. Um, so the, the lower St. Croix River circle there uh, it has minimal harvest when compared to the Rainy River and Lake of the Woods. Uh, the dashed blue line on the graph on the right shows the minimum length limit on the lower St. Croix River. And the dotted green line shows the number of lake sturgeon harvested. The most sturgeon harvested in a year since tags were implemented was eight in 2007 um, and four in 2015 after the minimum length limit was increased to 60 inches in 2009, making this um, mostly catch and release fishery. Only 21 lake sturgeon have been harvested from the St. Croix in the last 14 years. The one thing we do as a management tool is to tag lake sturgeon. They're a great fish to tag because they live a long time. Uh, they retain the tags well, and they're a species that do very well with catch and release. So um, 
this allows them to be caught multiple times. We can learn about growth rates, uh, population size, and fish movements based on this tagging information. Uh, fish in the river is long enough, and sooner or later you're going to catch a tag fish. We don't offer any rewards for catching a tag fish, uh, but we do ask that anglers report them, and we'll respond with a detailed history on that fish. There are a few different things to look for when it comes to tag sturgeon. Um, <clears throat> there are fish that were tagged by Minnesota and Wisconsin DNRs, and occasionally by other states or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. With the different agencies and 40 years of tagging, there are some different kinds of tags to look out for, um, and they're almost always placed on the dorsal fin. Different types of tags include metal bands, plastic tubes, steel wire with a plastic oval disc, and sometimes they might even have more than one tag like that fish in the lower right-hand corner. Each tag will have a unique number on it and the agency that applied it. Uh, the most important thing to get right on tagged fish is the tag number. Uh, there's going to be some gunk on the tags uh, that needs to be scraped off so you can read it. And there may be information on both sides of it. And if you can, try to take a picture of the tag number. Uh, so then the information can be reported on our website. Uh, you can go to the DNR, Minnesota DNR website and type tag fish into the search box and it will get you the, to the proper page to report the tag number, uh, fish length, catch date, and you actually click on a map to show where you caught the fish. Coordinates or screenshots on your phone can be helpful too since people may not always be real familiar with where they are, uh, especially when they're fishing on a new river. Uh, you're not required to provide contact information to report a tagged fish, but if you want to hear the history of that fish, uh, we'll, we'll need a phone number or preferably an email address. Uh, we started tagging lake sturgeon in, in, on the St. Croix River in 2003. A uh, number of fish tagged is in the dark blue bar with the green bar showing recaptures by DNR personnel and the light blue bar is showing the number of lake sturgeon tags reported from the public. Our biggest year for tagging was 2006, when we tagged 153 lake sturgeon. Uh, then tagging dropped off as we were working on other projects, uh, ultimately ceasing tagging after 2017. Even after we stopped tagging, uh, we continue to get reports, which really shows how well these fish do with catch and release and the fact that they're such a long-lived fish. Uh, to this day, we still get reports of fish being caught for the first time that were tagged 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, the Wisconsin DNR has continued their tagging effort over the last six years, and the Minnesota DNR is gonna resume tagging in 2023. To summarize the lake sturgeon tagging data, uh, to date we've tagged 715 lake sturgeon, 314 of which have been recaptured at least once. That's 44% of the tagged fish that have been seen again at least one time. The Minnesota DNR has recaptured 43 of those fish over the years, but the majority of recapture events have been reported by anglers, uh, with a few also reported by commercial fishermen. Some of the highlights is the breakdown of repeated catches, uh, with our current record of one fish being reported nine times. Uh, one thing anglers always want to know is where the tagged fish are. Uh, there's a strong belief from many veteran St. Croix sturgeon anglers that the warm water discharge from the coal-fired XL plant concentrates fish and influences fish behavior. It does make sense that a warm water discharge would attract fish in the winter, uh, but the operation of the plant's been changing, uh, not only operating during peak demand, and plans to cease operation and be coal free by 2028. Uh, while attracting fish and influencing feeding behavior may or may not be true, uh, my data shows lake sturgeon presence throughout the St. Croix River. 
It also shows a preference for anglers to fish in a particular area. Uh, these maps show the area known as Lake St. Croix, which begins at the Stillwater Lift Bridge and continues down to Prescott, Wisconsin, where the St. Croix empties into Pool 3 of the Mississippi River. Uh, each section is broken down in pinch points in the river, uh, with the Bayport section, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Bayport section stretching from the Stillwater Lift Bridge to the Hudson Railroad Bridge. The Lakeland section from the Hudson Railroad Bridge to Catfish Bar near Afton. The Afton section, or sometimes I call it the Kinney section, uh, from Catfish Bar down to the Kinnickinnick River confluence. And the Prescott stretch from the Kinnickinnick River down to the mouth of the river at Prescott. And then there's the riverine section uh, above the lift bridge that goes over 28 miles up to the dam of Taylor's Falls. Now, when we tag fish, uh, we try to spread them throughout the river. Uh, there are some areas where more fish are tagged because we're able to use different methods to collect and tag fish. Um, like the lowest Prescott section on the far right has almost half of our tagged fish uh, because commercial fishermen fish this lower stretch that's uh, circled in the, the purple oval. Um, we're often present there when commercial fishermen are operating uh, so we can, we can handle bycatch and we can actually collect sturgeon, tag them, and then release them. Here's the breakdown and the proportion of tagged fish by each section of the river. Uh, with our highest proportion in the lower section on the far right, aided by commercial fishermen, uh, followed by the Bayport section on the left, and then the riverine portion above the lift bridge, then the Lakeland and Afton sections. But when it comes to tag reports by anglers, about 41% come from the, from the Bayport section and the rest of the reports are 10 to 19% in the other sections, uh, as well as 5% of the reports that actually come from sturgeon caught in other rivers, like the Mississippi, Blue Earth, and Chippewa River in Wisconsin. One thing worth mentioning here is that tag lake sturgeon reported aren't necessarily reported by anglers targeting lake sturgeon. It's common for those targeting catfish to catch sturgeon, as the methods are very similar. But there are a fair number of reports that come from anglers fishing for walleye that will accidentally hook into a, a sturgeon. And finally, of importance to those watching, uh, the majority of lake sturgeon reported caught when ice fishing come from the Bayport section, uh, with the next closest from the lower Prescott section. This isn't because there's more fish in the Bayport section. Uh, that may or may not actually be true but the biggest contributing factor for the large proportion of tag sturgeon coming from this section is access. Winter access on the St. Croix is limited, and this area has the easiest and most well-known access for anglers to get on the river and target uh, sturgeon through the ice. So here's a, a final example of another type of tag you might see on Lake Sturgeon and, and where they're located. These are longer orange plastic tubes that hang off the fish, one placed under the dorsal fin, and the other is hanging out of an incision where I surgically implanted an acoustic transmitter with an expected battery life of 10 years. We implanted 20 lake sturgeon in the St. Croix River from 2013 to 2015. Uh, we then have about 70 receivers deployed in the rivers that record the date and time for each individual fish when it's within range of the receiver. We've collected millions of detections on these fish and documented their travels up and down the rivers and when they travel into rivers other than the St. Croix. The average size sturgeon with a transmitter was 45 inches, with the smallest being 28 inches and the largest being 63 inches.
I have a couple of examples of transmitter lake sturgeon movement I thought I would share. <clears throat> Sometimes these fish can travel hundreds of miles while others occupy relatively small home ranges of say 10 to 20 miles. Uh, generally, most of the lake sturgeon implanted with transmitters uh, within the St. Croix stay in the St. Croix. Uh, this fish, Lake Sturgeon 149, which was a 44 inch long fish in 2015, occupied a 17 mile stretch over a five year period uh, with 68% 68, 68 of the fish's detections um, in the section between the Hudson Railroad Bridge and Catfish Bar. So that's the section I call uh, the Lakeland Pool. Um, <clears throat> it has not been detected upstream of the Stillwater Lift Bridge or downstream of the Kinnickinnick River. Lake Surgeon 152 is one of those fish that would support the notion that Bayport's the place to be. Since 99% of its detections have been in that stretch over a four year period. It's never been detected south of the Hudson Railroad Bridge, and the only time it's, it has left Bay, the Bayport section has been on what are presumed to be annual spawning runs up to Taylor's Falls each spring. What we don't know is if this fish was sexually mature and if it's actually spawning. Uh, since it ran up to the dam every year, we assume this fish to be a male but it's possible that this fish is just running upstream because other sturgeon are running upstream in, the, upstream in the spring to spawn. We would actually have to get our hands on this fish in the spring to see if it's actually attempting to spawn. In 2015, uh, Lake Sturgeon 152 was 38 and a half inches long, uh, which is a little small to be a mature fish, uh, but it's not impossible. Most of our telemetry network uh, simply shows presence and absence when fish are in an area of the river, um, showing us large scale movements as they go up and down the rivers. But we do have some special telemetry areas that we maintain where we have multiple receivers in an area with overlapping detection ranges. Uh, this, is, this allows us to triangulate a fish's position when it's within this array. Uh, one of the areas where we have such an array is in Bayport, uh, adjacent to the warm water discharge from the power plant. Uh, data on Lake Sturgeon 152 over three years in this area shows the vast area the fish will inhabit with all of these blue dots representing triangulated positions, uh, not showing any real preference for one area in particular. Uh, it is less dense on the southern portion, but part of that's due to equipment location bias and positions to the far south lie outside of our overlapping network and aren't terribly accurate. I basically interpret this as this fish can be about anywhere, uh, maybe not so much in shallow water, but again, the shallower water is outside of our receiver array, so that could be a little bit misleading. Uh, I'll wrap things up on my end with a picture of the largest lake sturgeon we've ever sampled on the St. Croix River. Uh, we caught this monster in a gillnet in 2015. This fish measured 79 inches long and had a 30 inch girth. Uh, the biggest scale we had for weighing fish only went to 100 pounds and this fish exceeded that. Uh, using a conversion chart, we were able to estimate the weight of this fish at 125 pounds based on the length and girth. And if you look closely, you can see that we did actually tag this fish. So hopefully will somebody, somebody will catch this fish again someday and we can see how big it is over seven years later. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Tony Sint to cover ice fishing for these monsters. All right, thanks, Joel. Um... If for some reason people can't see my screen properly, let me know, but it looks like it's working on my end. Perfect, thank you. So Joel just gave an excellent overview of uh, lake sturgeon biology and um, fisheries management for the Lower St. Croix River, as well as some of the cool work he's doing with tagging and telemetry. 
Um, and as a fisheries uh, specialist with the Minnesota DNR, uh, I often also give talks similar to what J Joel did, talking about fisheries management and the work I do for my job. And today's kind of a cool shift from that with an opportunity to talk about fishing uh, and particularly talking about fishing for lake sturgeon through the ice. Um, so this is something I started doing uh, about six years ago um, once it became legal to target uh, lake sturgeon through the ice uh, when the catch and release season was expanded as Joel talked about a little bit. And I've been lucky to be uh, fairly successful despite uh, not necessarily doing it a whole ton. Um, and I'm excited today to talk about some of the tips I've learned just through trial and error um, to help other folks uh, be successful catching lake sturgeon through the ice because it's it's an awful lot of fun. Um, it's a great activity to do in the winter um, and a great thing to do with friends and family. I have really had a blast doing it and wish I had uh, more time to get out on the Synchro River myself. And I'm going to so I'm going to be talking somewhat specifically about ice fishing for lake sturgeon on Lake St. Croix. But a lot of what I'm going to talk about would be relevant to any lake sturgeon fishery. And there's certainly multiple places in the state where you can target them through the ice. So I'm going to start off by just touching on regulations briefly. Um, as Joel talked about uh, for the St. Croix River, the lower St. Croix River, there's a catch and release season uh, that is now from June 16th through March 1st. There's a short harvest uh, season within that window, but that's not really relevant to ice fishing uh, because it occurs before the river ice is over. Typically, the ice fishing season is starts when there's safe ice sometime uh, in December and goes through March 1st. Uh, most importantly is to familiarize yourself with the regulations before you go out fishing. Um, I could spend uh, too much time today talking about uh, all the regulations. And this is particularly important for places like the uh, Lake St. Croix or the St. Croix River because border water regulations typically differ from our inland lakes and rivers. And on the St. Croix River especially, there's there's even differences in regulations from one side of the river to the next. So for example, if you're on the Wisconsin side of the river, Wisconsin has some regulations on the hole sizes you can use through the ice. And the bait regulations also differ from one side of the river to the next. Um, I also, obviously we're talking about ice fishing, so I have to give the obligatory uh, safety message that ice is never 100% safe. And this is especially true on river systems like uh, the lower St. Croix River where there's current. Uh, ice is more variable and less, less predictable on rivers. Um, and areas that have the greatest and fastest current sometimes have no ice or can have very thin ice. So it's always important to check the ice thickness as you go. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but often people choose to fish for lake sturgeon at night. And so I found it's extremely helpful to use a GPS to um, track your trail on your way out, potentially, you know, during daylight, so that when you're then driving off or walking off the river at night, you can follow that same track and know that's where there was safe ice. And then, of course, always bring appropriate safety equipment like rope, uh, ice spike, flotation. And I, and I have pictured here a, a spud bar, uh, which is an excellent uh, safety tool and a great way for checking ice thickness as you go when you're walking out. So now we'll transition into talking about um, the, the fun part, the fishing for, for lake surgeon through the ice. And one of the most common questions I get is what rod and reel should I use? And this is a great question because uh, I suspect uh, many of you and myself, most of my ice fishing rods are meant for targeting bluegill and crappie and walleyes and are rather lightweight and rather small um, and obviously not going to be effective for catching lake sturgeon, which, uh, you know, as Joel mentioned, can reach pound, uh, weights exceeding 100 pounds. So you definitely need a heavier power ice fishing rod than you're probably used to. Um, some of the big mass producing companies make heavy duty uh, ice fishing rods that are typically meant for targeting uh, lake trout, uh, northern pike, or catfish. And there's a handful of custom ice rod companies that are now making rods specifically for targeting lake surgeon through the ice. And these are all typically uh, heavier powered, often a little bit longer uh, ice fishing rods. And I recommend finding one with a longer handle to help distribute uh, 
the flight of the fish into your forearm rather than having to handle all of that with just your wrist. Um, unlike open water fishing for sturgeon or catfish, you don't need a big giant mongo reel for holding uh, lots of line and making long casts. Uh, really just a medium sized spinning or casting reel will work great. You just wanna make sure it has a fairly strong and smooth drag. Uh, obviously a powerful fish like a lake sturgeon is gonna pull drag and having a good smooth drag will help uh, preventing uh, your rod and line from breaking. And I recommend using a medium strength braided line, uh, a roughly 30 pound strength. Uh, you wouldn't wanna use any line any uh, less with less strength than 30 pound test. Um, but using anything heavier than 30 pound braid or using a, a heavy monofilament often has too much drag in the water uh, with the subtle subtle current that is that is there in Lake St. Croix and will create a, a unnecessarily large bow in your line and can even uh, force your bait to get pulled down line, uh, downstream by having that heavier line. Um, and you can combat that by using a heavier weight but that's not really desirable for maximizing uh, your your bites and catches. So I, I found that 30 pound uh, braided line works best. So now I can talk a little bit about what bait to use and what tackle to use at the end of your line. Um, as Joel mentioned, sturgeon are bentivores. They swim around the bottom of the river uh, in search of uh, various food types from macroinvertebrates to mussels to fish. Um, so you can use various different baits to attract them. Um, I found that really the simplest, easiest, most effective bait uh, that you can buy at any uh, bait store or even uh, you know gas station is night crawlers. They work very well. Um, but you can also use things like fathead minnows or uh, cut pieces of larger minnows that you can buy at the at the bait shop. And you can also use various uh, fish scents or gels. Uh, as attractants as lake sturgeon, you know, they're primarily sensing their food um, via via taste or smell. Um, and and oftentimes, you know, I personally will put a combination of baits on my on my hook. So I'll you know put a whole bunch of night crawlers and a couple of fathead minnows on the hook, uh, to kind of just maximize the amount of bait down there and the amount of scent given off. Um, but you can also experiment with different baits on different lines. And there's really three common tackle configurations that I'm aware of that are effective for targeting lake sturgeon. Uh, the first is using, uh, you know, somewhat typical medium sized ice fishing spoon that's roughly a quarter ounce in weight. Um, and then beefing it up with heavy duty split rings and heavy duty treble hooks. Uh, most ice fishing or even open water spoons don't come with heavy enough hooks to handle a large lake sturgeon. Uh, then uh, uh, the second uh, tackle configuration is really sim is a really similar concept to the spoon, but it's using something like a sliding egg sinker and a heavy duty treble hook, and then separating the sinker from the hook with a line of beads to kind of allow that hook to a little bit be free floating from the weight. And then the third rig is is what I would consider a classic bottom fishing rig that people would typically use to target lake sturgeon or catfish or even walleyes while open water fishing. And that's really separating uh, a hook or uh, the hook from the sinker with a leader. Um, and for ice fishing, you need a rather short leader, just four to 10 inches long. Uh, I'd probably lean more towards the four to six inch range. And the leader is really just, you know, this can be the same line as your main line. It's just the amount, it's the line that's separating uh, the weight from your hook. And typically with the, this, this rig, you would use a little bit heavier weight, and then you would often uh, opt to use a circle hook rather than a treble hook uh, to prevent fish from getting deeply hooked. Circle hooks work, work great for making sure the fish gets hooked in the corner of the mouth. Um, and rather than kind of popping and setting the hook hard with a circle hook, you would, you would just reel into the fish where the other two rigs with the treble hooks, you would kind of set the hook uh, popping your wrist uh, when you detected a bite. And as I kind of alluded to before, you then want to load up the hooks with, with bait. You know, you don't just put one little piece of night crawler. You'd put a bunch of pieces of night crawlers and a bunch of fathead minnows on the hooks. 
Uh, so, so obviously, you know, when you're ice fishing, you're fishing through a hole in the ice and uh, a large lake sturgeon, which is what you're probably after if you're out uh, lake sturgeon fishing, uh, is not going to fit through a typical six or eight inch uh, ice auger hole. And, you know, a really big lake sturgeon is not even going to fit through a 10 inch auger hole. So uh, there's kind of multiple approaches for making a larger hole. Uh, typically, you cut either overlapping holes or separate holes with a six to eight inch auger. And if you cut non-overlapping or separate holes, you would then connect them with an ice saw or a chisel. And, and whether you do overlapping holes or not really depends on the type of auger you have. Some blades um, are more effective for cutting overlapping holes than others. I personally uh, like to cut three separate six inch holes and then use an ice saw to connect them. And that makes a really a perfect size hole for landing a large sturgeon um, and also not being over, overly large. Um, because you're using rather large holes, um, you know, fishing in an ice house with friends, uh, you per typically don't have room for, you know, two, two lines per person. Um, oftentimes you're going to just be fishing one line per person, maybe two if you're by yourself. And then be careful, you know, you're cutting large holes in the ice. You don't want to drop your phone or your fishing equipment or your expensive flasher down the hole. And you certainly don't want to drop your foot through the hole. And if you're fishing with, you know, kids, you definitely want to be careful to make sure they don't fall into the holes. So now we've talked about the rod and reel you need to use, uh, the bait and tackle, and cutting the hole through the ice. And now, you know, how do you actually go about fishing for them? Well, as I talked about, lake sturgeon are our bottom feeders or fish that swim along the bottom of the river or lake sucking up food. And they also surprisingly have a very subtle bite uh, given their size. Um, and this is typically because, at least in my experience, is because they just like to uh, spit out the hook before they really you know, take off with it. Or oftentimes they might suck in the bait and spit it out multiple times in a row. So you want to fish with your bait on the bottom. So whether you have the spoon or the bottom rig, you want to gently drop that down to the bottom of the river and set it on the bottom. You don't want to plummet it down because uh, it might get buried in the soft sediments at the bottom of the river, especially on the St. Croix. Um, so you set your bait on the bottom and then you need to be patient and wait for uh, some sort of indication of a bite. And then when you do notice that bite, you need to set the hook quickly. Uh, and one of the best ways for detecting a bite is using a slip bobber uh, to detect those very subtle bites. And this picture on this slide, I think, is, a, is excellent for showing this because there's multiple different ways of using a slip bobber to detect a bite from a lake sturgeon. So on the far left hole in this picture, uh, the angler has their slip bobber set or the knot on their line that holds the slip bobber in place set so that it's laying on its side. So any little tug of the line would probably cause that slip bobber to then stand up in the hole, indicating you know, time to set the hook. Uh, the next hole to the right uh, is using the same type of slip bobber, but it is set so that it's standing upright, which is kind of more traditional. And again, th these bobbers aren't keeping the bait suspended off the bottom. The bait is on the bottom and then the knots adjusted uh, for that depth. Um, so anyways, that second one, the, the bobber is set pretty traditionally and any sort of wiggle up and down. Uh, and certainly if the whole bobber went under the water, that'd indicate a bite, you'd set the hook. And then the third hole over is kind of a unique use of a slip bobber. They have it set so that the bobber is actually laying on a pile of snow next to the hole so that any little tug on the line would cause that bobber to slide down off that pile and into the hole, kind of creating a more disruptive indication of a potential bite. So there are just multiple ways to use a slip bobber to detect those very subtle bites. Oftentimes the bobber will just wiggle or bob a little bit um, and that's your cue to set the hook and hope that there's a lake sturgeon on the other end. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's another species or sometimes it's something, uh, you know, completely different that may have caused the bobber to move. So where to fish? Again, we're mostly talking about Lake St. Croix, which is uh, the stretch of the St. Croix River from Stillwater down to Prescott, Wisconsin. As Joel talked about, 
the Bayport area is one of the most accessible areas for getting onto the river in the winter, but you can you can catch lake sturgeon anywhere from Stillwater down to Prescott and beyond. Um, they, they really just swim around the river searching for food and any spot can be a good spot. And you can try, try to pick particular types of habitats or bathymetry such as fishing in deep holes or fishing along or at the bottom of steep drops. Some people like to fish the shallower 10 to 15 foot deep flats. Most people that I know that are targeting lake sturgeon like to fish somewhere in the middle of the basin. And really you can catch them in any depth from five to 40 foot of water um, and probably shallower and deeper. And when I say, you know, you can set up anywhere, I really, I really do mean that. You can really set up anywhere out in, out in the Lake St. Croix and have a very good chance of catching a lake sturgeon. Um, and it can be highly variable from day to day. One day you can be in a spot and you might, you and your friends might catch 10 lake sturgeon and the next day you might not catch any. Um, and sometimes it, it's worthwhile to move if you're not getting bites for a while. And other times it's, it pays off to be patient and let the lake surgeon come to you. Um, you can also fish for them day or night. Uh, my experience is they bite fairly well during the day, maybe a little bit better at night. A lot of lake sturgeon anglers like to target them at night. Um, obviously in the winter, our nights are long. So, uh, you know, most of the most of the day is not is dark out, but really you can catch them day or night. So you don't have to feel like you have to be out there at night or that you have to be out there during the day. Uh, whenever you have the time to get out fishing is a great time to try to catch a lake sturgeon. Um, and obviously, or maybe not obviously, you know, landing any large fish can be kind of chaotic. And this is especially true with a large, you know, 50 inch plus lake sturgeon. There's a few things you need to be prepared for that, you know, I honestly wasn't prepared for when I first hooked into my first big lake sturgeon through the ice. Uh, the first is to make sure you quickly reel up all the other lines that you have down in the house and maybe even in uh, nearby houses. If you have friends fishing, you know, 30 yards away from you, you might want to yell to them and ask them to reel up their line because uh, it's very likely that the lake sturgeon you're, you know, now have hooked up will make long runs and, and try to get tangled in other lines. And you're also hoping to land this fish, you know, in the near future, and you're going to need a, a place to pull up a 50 inch or larger fish onto the ice. You're going to, you know, have to move all your fishing gear to the side, move your coolers to the side, your chairs to the side, and be ready to land this large fish. Um, one little tip is to be conscious of your heater. I've seen multiple uh, lines get broken by getting burned on the heater or people singeing the, the sides of their snow pants, getting too close to the heater while while fighting a lake sturgeon. Um, get your pliers, camera, and tape measure ready. Uh, you want to be able to release the fish and document the catch rather quickly. And be, be, prepared, be prepared to get your hands wet. Obviously, you're not just going to use your rod to pull up a large fish through the hole. You're going to need to stick your arms down in the hole and, and grab the fish by its body or its uh, pectoral fins. Uh, you, you don't want to grab them by their mouth or by their gills. Uh, just harmful to the fish and not a great handle per se. And kind of along those lines, you know, this is an awesome catch and release fishery for the most part. Uh, and there's lots of big fish because catch and release is so successful. So you just want to do your part in making sure that the fish you release has a great chance of surviving. So, you, you know, use the right equipment to land the fish rather quickly. Handle the fish with care. Ideally, you're holding the fish horizontally with two, two arms rather than you know, vertically by its gills or something like that. And, and really for any fish, the best way to maximize its chance of survival when you release it is to minimize the amount of time it's out of the water. We all know fish breathe in the water, so keeping them out uh, as little as possible is best. And then when you're ice fishing, avoid exposing, exposing the fish to freezing temperatures. So it's, it's really ideal to be fishing in an ice house with a heater going. Um, if you know if it's as cold as it has been recently, it doesn't take long for the fish's fins and eyes to freeze if they're they're outside of an ice house. So just along the lines of catch and release, uh, as some of you might know, Minnesota does recognize catch and release records for a handful of species, including lake sturgeon. And in fact, the the catch and release record lake sturgeon was caught through the ice on the St. Croix River back in 2019 by Darren Trosef. That fish was 78 inches long, estimated to weigh over 100 pounds. 
uh, and you know, is a very impressive fish. But it, you know, as impressive a fish this is, it's not super unique because there are lots of 60 inch plus fish and 50 pound plus fish in the St. Croix River. And there's likely, as Joel showed it with his last slide, likely fish uh, larger than this one swimming out there. Um, and again, you know, this, this fishery is amazing because of the success of catch and release angling. Uh, the chart at the bottom right here is, is a, uh, a chart put together by the Bobbed Area of Fisheries that you can use length and weight to estimate, or length and girth to estimate the weight of lake sturgeon. So you don't have to worry about weighing a fish when you're out, out on the ice. Uh, just use a soft tape measure to get an estimate of its length and its girth, and then you can uh, estimate its weight from that. So I'll kind of speed through the, here things a little bit, but just a couple of tips on things not to forget when you go out uh, ice fishing for sturgeon. Uh, obviously, you need a pliers and scissors. An ice scoop is critical when you're making such large holes in the ice. Uh, don't forget your camera and a measuring device for recording your catch. Uh, dealing with uh, slimy lake sturgeon and mud puppies and uh, night crawlers is kind of messy, so bring you know some towels. Uh, if you're fishing at night, of course, don't forget a headlamp and other light sources. Uh, bring a big ice house so that you have plenty of room for you and your friends. Um, one thing that's kind of unique about lake sturgeon fishing through the ice is a sonar or a flasher is, is somewhat more optional and more just fun to have than necessary for getting bites because you're not jigging and enticing them to bite. Uh, you're just waiting for them to swim along and uh, suck up your bait off the bottom of the river. And then, of course, bring your friends, family, and kids because it's a great group activity. So lastly, I'll just touch on some uh, etiquette that's not necessarily unique just to lake sturgeon ice fishing, but of course, pick up your trash. Um, if you're making large holes in the ice, mark them with a stick or something so other people don't accidentally step in them. Um, don't set up near other anglers. This is more so true for lake sturgeon fishing because, as I mentioned before, you have a tendency of getting tangled in other people's lines uh, when these big fish make long runs. Uh, treat all the fish with respect, no matter what size they are. And you also uh, often catch mud puppies, which are a native uh, species, uh, and as well as catching fish that have lampreys on them. Lampreys are also a native species, and although parasitic, don't have a negative impact on the, the fish population. So, uh, you know, treat these organisms with, with respect as well and let them go. Um, so I'll just end by saying uh, with this slide here uh, that I hope, you know, these tips that I maybe provided will help you be successful uh, fishing for lake sturgeon through the ice. Um, and as these photos show, I'm pretty sure it's nearly impossible to take a picture holding a lake sturgeon without having a big smile on your face. So with that, I'm pretty much uh, done, and Joel and I would be uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you guys, both of you, for the great fishing advice. Tony and Joel, for sharing all your knowledge on the sturgeon fishery, sturgeon fisheries. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I did put the link to the um, size conversion thing in the chat. And I also put the link to the tagged, if you do catch a tagged fish, tagged sturgeon, on where to report that in the chat function. So if anybody wants to go there and save those. Um, so yeah, enter any questions you have into the Q&A section. Uh, Gordon asked one, what size circle hook do you recommend for sturgeon? Oh, that's a good question. Um, oh, I think typically like a, like a medium size circle hook would like a, five aught, four aught, something like that. If you're open water fishing for lake sturgeon, you usually use something more like a six or seven aught. So I typically use a little bit smaller than that, but you still want one that's large enough to fill up with a bunch of bait um, and that's strong enough for landing a big fish. So um, there's probably not a secret you know, size, but uh, somewhere in the three to six aught size would probably work well. And you were seeing last time when you were talking uh, the leader like the diameter of the leader didn't really make a difference or using a mono leader, you typically just use more of your braided line for that because they're not, they're, they don't have great eyesight, so they're not looking, they're not going to see your leader. But that's a lot of questions we get with walleye fishing and stuff is, well, what do you use for this and what do you use for that? And it doesn't make a huge difference here, right? 
Yeah, no, I, that's true. I, at least my perception and my experience is, you know, that the lake sturgeon aren't exactly line shy. So the leader material doesn't matter a whole lot. Again, I, you know, something like a 30 pound braid is going to work well. Some people, you know, if it makes them feel better, you can use like a fluorocarbon leader that's, uh, um, you know, not as easy to see. I, I suspect, you know, the way the sturgeon suck up the food off the bottom that they would actually feel something like a monofilament or a, a fluorocarbon line more so than they would a really supple, you know, thin braided line. But that's just my hypothesis. I don't know for sure. Great. I was just kind of looking at the poll. One of the questions, have you ever caught a sturgeon? 43% of the participants said they have. Have you ever caught a sturgeon through the ice? 63% said no. So we have a lot of people that are new to ice fishing for sturgeon. So that's kind of fun. And we have a couple people that are going to go out and try it after this webinar. I'm going to fall into that category for sure. So I was unsuccessful trying it last year, but I'm going to try it again this year. So again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A. So one other one um, for for Joel, if the uh, history, if you do catch a tagged fish, what type of information are you getting when you call in and report that for the history of that fish? Well, the, the kind of information that uh, we supply is, um, you know, we'll, we'll tell you the date of when we first caught it and tagged it, uh, the measurements of the fish, uh, you know, when we're uh, processing our fish, we're, we're getting a, a pretty accurate length and girth, uh, and almost always we get a, a weight on our fish as well. Um, and then I'll provide, you know, Whereabouts we caught we caught the fish and how far away it was from from where the angler caught it. And I'll also provide information like um, how many other anglers had caught it previously and about how far away they were uh, when they caught it. So, you know, we get a fish that's been caught eight times. I'm getting a report on seven other reports that I've gotten from anglers about where they've caught the fish and and what measurements they provided. And Joel, when, so when someone's reporting a fish, you know, if they have a, a length that they took, you know, that's great information to provide, but it's not required, right? The only thing that's required is to provide the tag number and the location. Um, the um, length is, is just nice to know. Is that right? Our, our online tag reporting system does require a length. Um, it, it will not uh, let you submit the tag fish report if you don't get a length. If you... And it, and it happens where people get excited. Um, they, one, they caught a really big fish, or two, they caught their first tag fish, and sometimes details slip through the cracks where you forget to get a length measurement, or maybe you don't have a, a measuring board or a tape with you. Um, you know, and if that happens, you just just give us an estimate and, and you know, don't really worry about it. We, it's not like we're making management decisions based on angler provided lengths. Um, but you know we we do uh, record that information in a database and, and hold on to it. So, um, but yeah, you won't you won't be able to actually submit the report online without inputting some sort of length. Good to know. Good question. Uh, Jeff was wondering, do you think we will see more management more? Or, excuse me. Do you think we will see more harvest allowed in the future in more locations? Um. Don't know yet. Uh, we're uh, talking about doing some more detailed sturgeon work. Uh, that's why uh, we are uh, resuming our tagging uh, in 2023. Um, we're gonna be doing some probably pretty heavy tagging efforts the next couple of years, uh, trying to get a, a better population estimate of how many fish are actually out there um, to see what kind of harvest we might be able to support. You know is there a possibility that we could have some sort of slot limit like the, the rainy river and lake of the woods um, where we allow harvest of 45 to 50 inch fish it's possible uh, but until we collect that data and, and get better estimates uh, i i can't answer that for sure yet but it's it's possible uh, some of that also depends on whether or not the anglers want it um, you know a lot of the, the fishermen that fish on the saint croix are strictly catch and release and they they want it kept that way um so if if there are anglers that strongly oppose it uh it's it's likely to not change 
Great information. I was surprised when you said there was only, I forget how many, it was like 14 fish caught in the last 20 years in the St. Croix or harvested. So the numbers were pretty low of the harvest, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, harvest is real low. You know, and, and the bar is set pretty high on the St. Croix with a, a 60 inch minimum length limit. Um, you know, so there are fish that are over 60 inches that are getting caught and released. Um, it's just a, a very small number of people that are actually harvesting the fish. Uh, Ryan had a question. Uh, I know this is ice fishing webinar, but is the summertime habitat the same? Meaning, could they be anywhere, or in the summer, is it more likely that they'd be in a deep pool area? That's a good question, and I don't have I don't have a great answer to that. I think um, so. Throughout the summer, if you know, if we're talking about summer specifically or just open water, I kind of suspect it's just talking about open water in general. You know, there's a, you know, as Joel talked about, kind of a migratory behavior of spawning lake sturgeon that'll typically run upstream and during the spring, and and that's during mostly the closed season, and then typically lake sturgeon will kind of move back downstream and into deeper water as the season progresses and into the winter. Um, but I yeah, I would suspect that during the summer you can still catch them most places they might um they might actually be looking for more current in the summer where at least my perception is in the winter uh when they're a little bit more lethargic they're looking to get out of the current um where in the summer they might be willing to be more so in the riverine sections in the faster current um and i think they'll probably more frequently use shallower depths than they do in the winter um a lot of sturgeon fishing effort seems open water on the St. Croix River tends to occur during uh, the fall. The fishing is just better and by that time of the year the most of the fish seem to be kind of moving to the deeper water. Um, you know so during like September, October, November um, it's one of the, some of the best open water fishing occurs and that's typically in the deeper deeper water uh, same places where you might be ice fishing. Yeah well one of the challenges that that happens on Lake St. Croix in particular during the summer months is that Lake St. Croix is big enough and deep enough with slow enough current that it actually does stratify where you have um, different temperature waters that layer and that lower section of water uh, runs out of oxygen in the summer. So if you're fishing you know, in July and August, if you're fishing deeper than 40 feet, you're probably not gonna be in an area where there's gonna be sturgeon for any extended period of time because the oxygen's gonna be so low. Um, so they're gonna they're gonna be in those well oxygenated oxygenated portions of water. So it's probably gonna be 30 feet and less. Um, and at each one of those sections of the St. Croix does um, stratify a little differently. So, um, you know, the the section around Bayport is the, the shallowest of those four sections of Lake St. Croix. Um, so you're, you've got a better chance of, of fishing on the bottom, but you might need to move a little bit shallower in the summer to, to get that well oxygenated water. Great points. We are just up again to the uh, one o'clock hour. So I want to thank you too. That was a very informative and interesting talk on, on sturgeon, a, a really cool fish that's you know, it's a pretty cool success story, success story that it was uh, overfished and has come back to be a really good fishery here around the state and some of our great rivers. So thank you both for, for coming today and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, everybody, I hope you have a happy new year. We will see you in the new year for episode 93 of the Moss program. And that's going to be uh, cooking and camp planning with uh, Jason Jack from the Red Wing ELC. So I think with that, we will stop the recording and we can jump back into our practice room.